morning. I'm really glad you're here. And I think for at least a few of you, it's not an accident. It could entirely be that God has orchestrated this week and this day for this moment. I talk to a lot of people who feel like large sections of their life are, well, the word most often used, the, the phrase is out of control. And we realize how little control we have when we try to bring authority or order to a situation. And I think our tendency is to try to access some kind of authority from somewhere else to make things work again. In our home, in our workplace, just in our lives. But the place that the authority of God takes its first seat is right here. Right here. We've got to turn a corner where we stop asking God to take control of something or someone else and give God permission to exercise his authority right here. So would you do something with me this morning? Would you just place a hand over your heart? And I want us to sing this chorus again. Hallelujah, our God reigns. But I want you to think about it. He does reign over all things and over all the universe and over all the world and over all situations. But I want us to invite him to reign right here in our hearts today because that's the seed of the beginning of a difference in our lives. So let's lift our voice together. Hallelujah, our God reigns. Hallelujah, our God reigns. Hallelujah, our God reigns. Forever all my days, hallelujah. Now, Father, there will be moments, even in this day, where we have the choice of submitting and surrendering to your authority or choosing our own path. Would you help us choose your authority and your path? In Jesus' name, amen. Um, we're in Genesis. You probably are aware of that. And today I want to talk about relationships. Um, a lot of us are injured in them or feel we're absent of them. And so I'd like to get a glimpse of what God intended in human relationship. Genesis 1.26, it says, God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and over all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move on the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then if you look over in Genesis chapter two, beginning in verse 18, it said, the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. Whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky, to all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. And then the Lord God made a woman out of the rib he had taken from the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. These verses are, are filled with stunning imagery and incredible information about relationship. And the more culture has moved away from its understanding, the more prices we have had to pay 
for how people interact with each other. Genesis reveals that you were created for relationship. It wasn't an afterthought. In fact, it's the primary reason. It's fascinating because when God makes all other things, it says, God said, let there be light. God said, and, and, and the earth and water was separated. God said, and, and we, we're not given any clues about his being until he goes to create man. And then he says, let us make man in our image. Who's us? Now, some people think that God is speaking in the royal we, like kings and monarchs tend to do. But there's no indication that he does that in other places, so why would he be inconsistent? And some people think, well, he's, he's talking to the angels, but it doesn't say that we're created in the image of God in angels. It says we're created in the image of God. This is an insight into Scripture, a very early clue about the nature and the being of God. God in three persons. God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We actually didn't get out of the first two verses in Genesis before we were given a clue regarding this because it didn't say that God hovered over the face of the deep. It says that the Spirit of God hovered. And then we're actually given another creation account in Scripture, and that's found in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, and it says, in the beginning. Do you see the reference? Just like Genesis, it starts, in the beginning. In, in Genesis, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. Isn't it interesting? The first thing God says is, let there be light. And we're seeing the reference to this here. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And down to verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace. When I was a child, somebody told me that the reason God made people was because he was lonely. And what scripture actually reveals is God was not alone and God was not lonely. At the actual center of the universe is a relationship, a loving community. C.S. Lewis is one of the great Christian thinkers in human history. And he said that the fundamental thing about the relationship and the Trinity is that they're interactions of mutual love and delight. Their relationship is better than any relationship you've ever seen or read about. And this, this is why this is important. God reveals his relational being. Let us make mankind in our image. This is fascinating. This is why we do not feel right when our relationships are broken or we are out of relationship. Some people think that faith is fighting for a cause. It, faith is not a fight for a cause. Faith is a relationship with God and with others. God isn't in the process of making little worker bees to keep the garden the way that he wants them to be, or creating puppets that will do exactly what he wants, or creating slaves that can only carry out assignments. God is creating friends. The relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was so good and so great, they eventually came to the conclusion that we just can't keep this to ourselves. Wouldn't it be even better if more people were brought into it? In John chapter 17, Jesus is involved in a prayer, and this is what he said. He looks for, toward heaven and he prays, Father, the hour has come. So he knows he's heading to the cross now. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to those you have given him. Listen to this. This is a fascinating verse right here. Now this is eternal life. You want to know what eternal life is? Here's the definition. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. It's relational. Eternal life is not something that happens when you die. Eternal life begins the moment you're introduced into a relationship with God. Jesus actually defines eternal life as knowing God. And you are invited. You 
are included. You were created for a relationship with God and with others. It wasn't an afterthought. It wasn't a side effect. It's the primary reason you are here. Then Genesis tells us another surprising thing, that perfect circumstances are not enough to create a good life. Perfect circumstances are not enough to create a good life. Adam is created and he's placed in the Garden of Eden, which as near as we can tell is the best place any human has ever been ever in the history of humanity, right? We've all been trying to recreate the Garden of Eden. And so we try to find places that we assume are, are tropical and, and palm trees. And how many could use a little tropical and palm trees and sunshine yeah, today? Yeah. So Adam is, is placed and he's given the most delicious food you can possibly eat. And he's given a significant assignment and that is to name the animals. And, and we, he's not just calling me, I will name you Timmy, and I will name you Jimmy. That's not what he's doing. He's, he's naming the animals by, by, by species and by genus. And even when he comes to Eve, he doesn't name her Eve in the passage we read. He, he names her woman. It, it requires significant powers of observation. Significant attention to detail to, to be able to do this. So Adam is engaged in very interesting work. And then God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. He's got the perfect job. He's got the perfect place to live. He's got the perfect food. And it's not enough. For those who think that if you believe in God and you have a relationship with God, you don't need anybody else, you're going to have a real problem with this passage because God says it's not good for the man to be alone. And God was there. How do we reconcile this? Well, I can tell you what our culture does. Our culture basically tells us that, that we should put our relationships on the back burner until we have the things in order in life that we, we want in the way that we want them. So work really hard, make a lot, own a lot, enjoy life before you, and then they put the words in, right? Tie yourself down. That is the cultural view of relationship. What scripture says is paradise is not good enough. People with great relationships can actually live with a lot less and still feel like their life is full. People who have access to everything and anything they want, anytime they want it, can still feel like their lives are completely empty. Some of us are better at making money than making friends. Some of us are better at building things than building relationships. The challenge is it will always feel like something is missing because you were created for relationships. Now, that leads us to another thing that Genesis teaches, and that, that is that there are, only, there are some things that you only learn in community. There are some things you cannot learn on your own by using your own powers of deduction or your own intellect. The, the truth is most of us wouldn't have learned much if we didn't have someone who taught us. You say, well, I don't need a teacher or pastor. I've got YouTube. Good, <laughs> but somebody posted on YouTube. Like that, you didn't just turn on a camera and get smart. Like that's not how it actually works. Uh, and we often assume that that it's the teacher that that impacts all the learning, but our fellow students also impact learning. We learn how to love from people who are good at loving. We learn how to give from people who are good at giving. Every single person in our life is capable of teaching us something if we're open to learning from them. Every single one of us have significant blind spots. And I've, I've had people say, I know what my blind spots are. No, you don't. <laughs> you, you're blind to them. That's the point. Now, I know, and, and I'll be the first, there have been broken and unhealthy people in our lives that told us things that were not true, and they did a lot of damage to us. But the solution to that is not to have less people in our lives. The solution to that is to have healthier people in our lives. Genesis isn't, by the way, this is not just an argument for the only relationship that is a biblical relationship is marriage. 
That's not what this is saying. In fact, Christianity is really one of the only world religions that elevates singleness and blesses it. It doesn't say it's better than marriage, but it does say you can live a single life and that is as valid an experience as anything, any way that you can choose to live in this world. Marriage is a different kind of relationship, but it's also true that it's not the only kind of relationship. Why does that matter? Because we need friends in our lives or we tend to make choices that aren't healthy for us. I, I mean, I don't have any science to support this, just a lot of years in ministry and counseling. And I believe that if you don't have good friends, you are more likely to marry the wrong person because they will see things in you and in that other person you will not see in yourself. They'll come along and they'll say, I, I really don't care the, w the way that they talk to you. They seem to be putting you down. Why do you tolerate that? And we weren't even aware it was happening because we have blind spots. Um, Healthy people might never learn of God's healing abilities. If, if, we're, if we're healthy, how would we know that God heals? If, if we're always confident, how would we know that God can give peace to anxious people? If we're knowledgeable, how would we know that God gives wisdom to those who seek it? There are broken and struggling people in life. And if we're not in that position, we might not know God's heart towards them. We need people in our life, which, which leads us to this point. This is the last point I, I wanna make today. And that is the difference makes the difference. It's, it's interesting to me, God did not give Adam a replica of himself, a duplicate of himself. He gives him a human, but a human that is very different from himself. This is a phenomenal idea. And it reveals, by, by the way, even how God creates woman is a phenomenal concept. Uh, God takes Adam's side. And, and we use the word rib because there's not a great word to translate what's happening here. It, it, uh, actually, we get a clue from from Adam himself, right? He said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. God is doing more than just taking a rib out of, out of Adam's side. He's taking Adam's side. And he's creating someone out of this. Someone that God intended to walk with and work with Adam. And, and he uses a phrase, and this, this, there's a, 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 real, a real challenge with this phrase. And the phrase is that, that God made him a suitable helper. Oh, look at that, a little marital assistant. <laughs> you, you, you do this work and, and I'll, t I'll take care of the, the other things. This is not a subordinate word at all. The word is used over 90 times. Suitable helper is used over 90 times in scripture. Most of them for God himself. And the rest of the times, for an ally who is bringing military army to help you in a battle to overcome your enemy. How is that a marital assistant? This is why we need to be exposed to Genesis. The way we think about genders often is based on what our world tells us and what the culture teaches us instead of what scripture actually has to say. God didn't create a lesser gender. God created a suitable helper. God created someone who could come alongside and it's, this is very important. They're different from Adam. Eve is different from Adam. This is a huge problem we have. Our tendency is to spend our time with people who are just like us. We'll walk into a place, we'll skin it with a kind of speed that's hard to, to, to time. And we're looking for anybody like us, anybody like me, anybody like me, nope, I don't belong here. How did you come to that conclusion? Like, wh what are you thinking? Do you really believe that the only place you belong is when somebody looks exactly like you? If that was the case, Adam, God would have given Adam another Adam. And he doesn't. It's a different kind of relationship that would actually create the potential for life. 
Now, I realize gender realities are being addressed in this passage, but I also think that there's other things being addressed in this passage. The, our potential is limited if all we do is hang around people just like us. It will be more comfortable, it will be less stressful, but the, the likelihood that you're going to grow significantly or learn something new when you hang around people just like you is reduced a lot. We are called to intentionally develop relationships with people who are remarkably different from us. We are supposed to institute relationships with people who come from different ethnic backgrounds. We're supposed to institute relationships with people who have different financial experiences and resources. We are supposed to institute friendships with people who hold different political views. <laughs> Pastor, that's a bridge too far. I mean, I'll hang out with anybody except that party. Hmm. By the way, uh, in our culture right now, statistics show that you're more likely to marry outside of your faith than you are outside of your political party. We're to initiate friendships with people who, who like different kinds of food, who listen to different kinds of music, who play different kinds of games, who read different kinds of books, who watch different kinds of movies, who wear different kinds of clothes. Without this, we experience less and we learn less. The only thing we are more of if we don't experience this, we're more boring. We limit our lives when we only spend time with people just like us. I'm going to have the worship team come out. The passage that we read in Scripture ends with the statement that both the man and the woman were naked and they felt no shame. No embarrassment. No hiding. No protecting. No pretending. And we all crave that kind of relationship. We crave it. But the truth is, we often lack the courage to try it. What will they see? What will they think? What will they say? If I can just hang around people who are just like me, then they already think like me and they already talk like me and that's where I'm most comfortable. If I hang around people that are different from me, what if they know me and don't like me? Human beings hiding from each other has been happening since the very first sin. So a good question is, what does God do in response to this? And it's stunning. I don't know what your view of God is, but I want you to pay real close attention to the next couple of minutes. He sends his son, Jesus, and he's born into this world without any of the status symbols that would make him attractive to anyone. And this man who has virtually nothing chooses not to live in isolation, but in community and not just for an hour once a week. But every day, with people. He didn't hide anything. And he shared everything. And people who didn't want anything to do with God, or anything to do with religion, couldn't get enough of spending time with him. They flocked to him. They crowded in around him. And I wish I could tell you that everyone was happy with that, but not everyone was. He was arrested and he was beaten. He was brutally tortured. Scripture actually tells us that the soldiers responsible for this had a little gambling game to see who would get his clothes. And somebody won that bet. And then they took Jesus, the Son of God, naked, and hung him on a cross. God, naked, on a cross. 
and not ashamed. Naked and no shame. Because he came to remove our guilt and our shame. And once you realize how much God loves you, you don't have to pretend anything anymore. The reason our relationships fail is because we're constantly hiding, we're constantly protecting ourselves, and we're constantly trying to find ways so that we don't ever have to, to be in a place that feels uncomfortable. But once you know how much God loves you, it gives you the courage to be able to open up conversations with anyone. You're already loved, you're already valued, you're already known, you're already accepted. So my question to you is have you considered a relationship with him. I'm going to ask everyone just to bow your head right now. Maybe for you, religion is something you've preferred to avoid, or maybe you've come to believe is actually a negative thing in this world. Uh, maybe for you, you've never even considered the option. You're, you're here by a set of circumstances today with a friend or a family member. But I would like to introduce you to Jesus. I'm, I'm not trying to get you to sign on to a set of doctrines. I'm not trying to get you to, to follow a set of rules. I want to introduce you to someone who already knows you, already loves you, already values you, already accepts you. And just you getting to know him can change your life forever. So if you're, if you're in this room and you want to start that journey today, you want to start that journey today, I'm just going to ask you to lift a hand up. Just lift it up. Let me see it. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you. I see that hand. Anyone else? Just lift it up. This is a good day to get introduced to Jesus. Thank you. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Anyone else? Just lift it up. Now I'm gonna ask, for some of you, it's not about starting a relationship, it's about restarting a relationship. That you've allowed your faith to become a fight for something instead of a relationship with someone. And if you'd like to restart your relationship with Jesus today, just lift your hand up high. Yeah, I see all those hands, thank you so much. Can we all stand together? And I'm gonna ask everyone to repeat this prayer out loud and together with me today. Heavenly Father, I want to know you. I want to know what you think. I want to hear what you say. And I want to see what you see. I want to be in relationship with you. That's why I'm here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's welcome some people into the family of faith this morning.